Well, we're having our own Dada event here today because this is a Salvador Dali painting and it's upside down. Now, I'd like to give that painting a little music. I've made a mistake. The painting is upside down and so is the music. Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> and here's the painting right side up. This picture You've probably seen before, it's called The Persistence of Memory. It was painted in the 1930s. It's an example of surrealism or surrealism, a movement that picked up some threads from Dadaism. The word means super realism. The Dadaists opposed reason, and so in a, in, a, in a way did the surrealists. The surrealists opposed ordinary logical thought processes and they wanted instead to go into the real truths of human knowledge by taking mental shortcuts, dreams, unconscious associations. They felt contained more truth than logic or rhetoric did. The influence of Sigmund Freud on this movement is quite strong. You could say that surrealism equals Dada plus Freud. Now there's a lot of conscious thinking and academic technique behind that painting, but the basic idea, watches melting in a kind of a dreamscape, does an end run around ordinary reasoning and it makes this a surrealist painting. The reason I've gone this far into art is to suggest that related effects were achieved in music by analogous means. There was no surrealist movement in music, but there was a group of Parisian composers in the 20s whom Cocteau named Les Six, or The Six. These six composers worked in an environment that included the Dadaists and the Surrealists, and they faced the same culture and political dilemmas that these artists did. Now, I'm not going to say that their music expresses the same thing that a Dali painting does, but think of it this way. If those watches melted to a musical accompaniment, wouldn't this be the right music? Get the electricity on because you should see this slide. Are we unplugged, then? Are we unplugged? Yes, we were. Right. Okay. Watch your feet over there, my dears. Okay. I'm going to back this up a little bit because you should be looking at this painting while you hear the music.
is that music surrealistic? The word isn't used about music, but there certainly is some parallel with the painting. The tunefulness of the music is twisted, distorted, you could almost say melted by the foreign key signatures that crowd in on the musical space. That passage was from a ballet called Le Bus sur la Trois, or The Bull on the Roof. It was written by Darius Mio in 1919. He wrote it as a reminiscence of music he had heard while living for some months in Brazil. Mio was one of the six that Cocteau publicized. That device of using more than one key at the same time is known as polytonality. More than one key or tonality at once. Mio often used polytonality, and a good example of bitonality, as we call it, when two keys are involved, occurs in this passage uh, from Le Bouffe sur le Toit. Let's break that apart. Bitonality can be demonstrated better at the piano. The music starts in one key. And then the other key slides in. Put them together and they spell not mama, but dada. In his later and crazier period, Picabia used to draw a picture while Andre Breton stood by and erased it. There is nothing in the music of the 20s to compare with that, but Mio and Eric Satie once did something equally recondite. They prepared music that wasn't supposed to be listened to. Music intended as a mere background for a theater intermission. Of course, when they tried it, everybody stopped talking and listened and heard the naked repetitions of this musique d'ameublement, or furniture music. Satie ran around telling them not to pay attention, but everyone ignored him. Eric Salzman tried the same thing a few years ago in connection with the New York Museum exhibit, and he was more successful at not being listened to. <laughs> Another thing that was characteristic of Dada and post-Dada art was the use of new materials. Andre Masson, for example, found paint and canvas unresponsive to his needs to improvise freely. So he did pouring of paints on sand and then froze the results in varnish. The following ex uh, musical example uh, in illustrates a similar thirst for new materials and media of that time. It's a passage from a Mio ballet written partly in jazz style or language in 1923, and it's called The Creation of the World, La Creation du Monde. Dadaists often borrowed styles from commercial art to make their points. For example, Duchamp once got off a spoof on the critic Apollinaire, who was very influ influential in the advanced art world before 1920, by taking a sign that the Sapolin Paint Company had mass produced to advertise its enamel paints and converting it into one of his ready-made art objects. 
Duchamp called this girl in a bedstand, and it reminds one of Andy Warhol. Like many composers of that period, Mio had a flair for using commercial materials in his music. In Le Bouffe de la Toile, for instance, he creates a distinct circus band effect. This piece is uh, really a catalog of Latin dance rhythms. This, for example, is a tango. There's also a section here that sounds like mariachi music, which is Mexican, not Brazilian. As with Roy Lichtenstein, the ostensible commercialism of these passages is only a surface. It's a deception. The musical structure underneath is as hard as steel. There is a quality of restraint and economy that is common to the music and the painting of the 1920s. One of the Parisian painters of that period was Pete Mondrian. Look at the 1922 painting, which is called Composition. And it limits itself to three primary pigments and black and white. And this is minimalism in painting. Listen to minimalism in music. This is Poulenc's perpetual motion. Another use of minimalism occurs in Le Bouffe sur la Toile, which uses a small, shrill orchestra that is really a, like a theater pit band. When this band tries to sound like a symphony orchestra, which the composer has it do several times in the piece, the result is both amusing and sad. And the failure is somehow endearing when you hear it, and Mio meant it to be endearing in precisely that way. This work, Le Bouffe de la Toile, is one of my favorite pieces from the period, not only because of what it is 
as a piece of music, but because of what we know about it as a stage show. It was done in 1920 as a stage show. And that production, which wasn't a ballet, but was more a pantomime, reveals to us now, who we'll look back on it, the community of concern for the arts and their new possibilities that existed in Paris at that time. Mio had written Le Bouffe as a musical impression of Brazil. And at first, he had a vague idea of using the work as accompaniment to a silent film comedy by Charlie Chaplin. But Cocteau came up with a different idea to use Le Bouffe to accompany a pantomime farce played live on the stage. When this was performed in Paris and London, it became an instant classic of international high spoofery. By the time it reached performance, the project had involved the collaboration of the artist Raoul Dufy and the leading performers of the Medrano Circus, including the Fratellini brothers, a famous trio of clowns. The plot was nonsense, post-data nonsense, involving casual flirtations, murders, and resurrections. All of the performers on stage worked inside huge, absurd papier-mâché masks, masks made of paper. The music of Le Bouffe was unrelentingly fast, so Cocteau made every stage movement unrelentingly slow. The music was French-Brazilian, so Cocteau's story was placed in an American speakeasy. It was during the regime sec prohibition. Cocteau said about the work, nothing happens, or what happens is so crude, so ridiculous, that it is as if nothing happens. It is an American farce by a Parisian who has never been to America. Probably the greatest collaboration among the arts in this period, the one that made the rest possible, happened in 1917 among a group of men influenced by the Dada spirit, although none of them was a certifiable Dadaist. I'm speaking of the creation and production of the ballet Parade, an achievement that made public figures of its three chief collaborators, Eric Satie, Pablo Picasso, and Cocteau. Parade kept the, <coughs> it had a fairground as its setting but it is occupied by modern American carnival. A few performers do their routines outside the main tent, trying to get customers to come in and see the show. A Chinese magician does tricks, a girl dancer does several steps and fires a revolver, and a pair of acrobats do stunts. Three managers argue about how to run the show. That's it. But it was the simplicity of this ballet that was breathtaking, shocking. It swept away the facades of pre-war art just a couple of weeks after some of the worst battles of that war were raging on the Western Front, only 150 miles away. Social Paris flocked to the matinee premiere of Parade along with a number of left bank artists. This crowd was goaded into violent reaction by the calm understatement of the whole production, by the indictment it pronounced on several preceding generations of theater, art, and music. The collaboration process that led to this result was a case study of intrigue and misunderstanding. Here are two letters to Valentin Gross about Parade. One is from Jean Cocteau and the other from his collaborator, Eric Satie. And here is the first from Cocteau, September 4th, 1916. 4th, 1916. Make Satie understand that you can cut through the FLE. not a simple pretext for music. It hurts me when he dances around Picasso screaming, it's you I'm following, you are my master, and seems to be hearing for the first time from Picasso's mouth things that I have told him time and time again. Does he hear anything I say? Perhaps in all, it's all an acoustical phenomenon. Besides, I probably exaggerate the way sick people and here is the second letter from Eric Satie to Valentine Gross. It's written Thursday, September 14, 1916. Cher Egdusami, if you knew how sad I am, Parade is changing for the better behind Picasso's bed. Picasso has ideas that I like better than our Jones. How awful. And I am all for Picasso. <laughs> and Picasso doesn't know it. Picasso tells me to go ahead, following John's text, and he, Picasso, will work on the moment. He goes, which is bad, and he's ridiculous. I'm half crazy and depressed. What am I to do? 
Now that I know that not only one will I live, I'm heartbroken to accept the need that the last one that the life is about to drop. Oh, yes, let's drop it again. What am I to do? What am I to do? Right in the back. Cocteau went to Rome with Picasso. There they met the choreographer, Sergei Lifar, and the producer, Sergei Diaghilev, who was the impresario of the famous Ballet Russe. In Rome, Cocteau browbeat Lifar into clearing all the dance steps with him before they were taught to the dancers. Cocteau had less luck telling Picasso what to do, and he was unhappy with the restraints that his costumes put on the dancers. Here and now, 75 years later, it is Satie's music for Parade that remains available to us, still as fresh and as shatteringly serene as it was the day of the first performance. It becomes monumental by absolutely shunning the monumental. It creates calm, but the calm is fearful. It encompasses not only the designedly trivial events of the ballet scenario, but also the momentous and terrible events of the world around that time. It absorbs the thousands of men dead in a single futile assault and the mutinies of the survivors who didn't want to be wasted on the battlefield. This music hints at the glories of the Romantic era and shrugs them away in its level progress. The new century is getting on with its own life and is developing its own arts to communicate that life. Regardless of the rejections and destructions that thunder around it, Parade is not the response to tragedy of a culture that is sure of itself, like the Greek culture. It is not how the Greeks responded to such a disaster. Such a response, a Sophoclean response, was not possible in Paris in the 20s. But Satie and the Dadaists did have a great respect for life, and next to their confusion and nihilism was the spirit of humanity and a yearning for righteousness, even though they rejected everything around them. That's the prelude from Parade. Eric Satie had been born for that moment. He had been out of place in the aristocratic jockeying of the turn of the century world of Paris arts. But with the death of Impressionism and the rise of Cubism, the decline of Montmartre and the flowering of Montparnasse, the prophet of the new French music could not be denied. He was a strange, sad man, isolated in alcoholism and an intimidating neck for clever language. He heard the first performance of Debussy's La Mer, which has a movement entitled From Dawn Till Noon on the Sea. And he said afterward that he particularly liked the passage at quarter after 11. When a work of his was badly received, he wrote a rebuttal that stated, those who do not understand are requested by me to assume an attitude of submission and inferiority. <laughs> In the eight years that he lived after Parade, Satie came into his own as the musical grandfather of Paris, and he sat as kind of an archbishop over Cocteau and the Six. Diaghilev closed the production of Parade after two performances, but the effects were lasting. Picasso began to make big money from his painting. Cocteau prided himself on the fact that he had joined in one project the left bank world of bohemian artists, poets, and composers with the right bank world of Ballet Russe and its rich patrons. And it gave Satie a public beginning 
from which the post-data musical styles of Mio and Lacis could grow. How nice it is that Satie has had a spell of popularity with record buyers. Do we have time for the end of Parat? Yes, we do. This is the finale. Somehow American life and its concerns are very much involved in what happened in Paris after World War I. The careers of Duchamp and Picabia took critical turns in New York City, and Americans flocked to Paris to enjoy the ferment there 10 years later. And we mustn't forget Edgar Varese, to whom Frank Zappa looks uh, as his chief influence who went to Paris, <clears throat> from Paris to New York in 1916 and stayed in New York the rest of his life. Somehow New York became relevant to the brightest spirits in France and Paris became relevant to the brightest spirits in America. Now France went through a spiritual death during the First World War and the freshness and tenderness that sprang up in so much of the outrageous art of the 1920s was a resurrection, a rebirth. The fact that Americans found all this so compelling suggests that our culture also was experienced death in the period, a somewhat different death, and perhaps we're still in the throes of it. We still find spiritual nourishment in the Paris of half a, tw a, half a century ago. The Dadaists, as I, as I said before, regarded capitalism, imperialism, and religion as their foes. Certainly, American life has been closely entwined with those forces in this century. I will not make further parallels now. That would be too hard or too easy. But I would like to say that 
the 20th century art that you know, the painting, the literature, and music came out of this period. And I would like to point out to an, that, that to an American who lives as a musician and who dreams every day of fruitful collaboration with the other arts, the spectacle of Paris 